Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Wednesday night reading of the book of Genesis. Uh, we took a week off last week and I uh, apologize if you, some of you uh, tuned in looking for a new series. But we're back today and we're in the book of Genesis again and we're moving along following the story of Abraham, of course. And that'll change eventually to his son, his grandson, and then his great-grandchildren. But the story really does focus on Abraham. The New Testament presents Abraham as the father of the faithful. The New Testament presents Abraham as the one through whom the promise comes, of course based on Genesis chapter 12, that through Abraham's seed, God would bless all nations. Remember, we, we've seen the rocky road that uh, humankind has been on from creation, or at least from the fall of Genesis 3, all the way through the call of Abraham in Genesis 11 and Genesis chapter 12. And the nations are in trouble. Remember, they, the story of the Tower of Babel, they, they, they get there, they try to make a name for themselves, and they're scattered with all these different languages and everything. And it looks almost as if uh, the, the, the project that God was involved with with humankind is in serious trouble, and it is, but God is not done with the humankind yet, and he calls Abraham, and he promises that through Abraham's seed, all nations would be blessed. And so we're going to be in chapter 15, chapter 16, and chapter 17 with a reading from each. And again, as I've been saying throughout, I hope that you're reading these chapters on your own and able to formulate uh, the story in your mind and questions and and uh, engage in the, in the text yourselves as we go through these weeks. <clears throat> but to, tonight, one of the main things I want us to focus on is the idea of trusting that the one who makes the promises is ultimately responsible for seeing that the promises come true. We may have a part to play and we may be called to show up in faith but that doesn't mean we take control from God. We are not the ones who will see things through. It's God who promises, which means God is the one who must make the promise come true. And that plays a lot uh, in Abraham's story, and it plays a lot in our story as well. Sometimes maybe we grow frustrated or concerned because we don't see things happening the way they should, and so we think we've got to take matters into control in order to help God out or whatever. And Abraham uh, falls victim to this a few times. He, ha he has a long history of faith with God, but he does fall victim to this a few times, and he pays a price for it. So Genesis chapter 15, Genesis chapter 16, Genesis chapter 17, realizing that up to this point, Abraham does not yet have a son, and yet God has promised Abraham that through his seed, through him, all nations would be blessed. How is God going to bless the nations if Abraham himself doesn't have a child? So let's pick it up. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 6. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliza of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir. Your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. God's covenant with Abram. But Abram doesn't know how God is going to accomplish his covenant. And this is a good reminder for us sometimes is if God has promised something, we may not know all the details. And it's a good challenge for some of us who have control impulses, right? That we have this impulse to control things. It's difficult sometimes to not know how things are going to happen. But maybe that's not even our job to know how things are happening. But we just need to trust God when God says, this is what I'm going to do for you. And so God comes to Abram again in chapter 15. There's been a few things happen with his nephew Lot, remember, and uh, Melchizedek and, and the war and so on. And God says to Abram, don't be afraid. I am your shield and your reward will be great. 
And this is God's call to Abram. Don't be afraid. Even when you don't know how things are going to be, don't be concerned about it. Don't be afraid. For I am your shield, and your reward will be great. You know, Jesus, before dying on the cross and resurrecting from the dead and going back to heaven to be with God, he said to his disciples in John 14, don't let your hearts be troubled. John 14, 1. Just trust in God. Trust also in me. You may not know how things are going to happen, but they're going to happen, Jesus said. I, I'm going away. I'm going to prepare a place for you in my Father's house. So don't. Don't be afraid. Don't be troubled. Abram doesn't figure, doesn't see how God's going to work things out. So Abram offers a solution to what Abram believes is an ungetaroundable dilemma. And it does show that no matter how reasonable or logical we think our thinking is, human reason and human logic cannot cover all the areas of faith. We may not know how it's possible for everyone to be raised from the dead to live with God forever, Faith tells us it is, not human reason or human logic. So Abram sees this dilemma as ungetaroundable, an 80-some-year-old man with a 70-some-year-old wife who has no children. How is it possible? And so he says it's ungetaroundable. So he comes up with a solution for God. And I want to ask you tonight, how tempting is it to think we need to figure out the how? And he says to God, I am childless. The heir is Eliza of Damascus, and Eliza of Damascus is faithful and loyal to Abram. And if you'll notice, Abram kind of blames God. He says, what will you give me? For I continue childless. You have given me no offspring, God. And so God gets specific with Abram and says, you will have a son. And before we get too hard on Abraham... Genesis 15, 6 is one of the foundational verses of Scripture. The Apostle Paul uses it in the book of Romans. Abraham's or Abram's great belief in the Lord. He believed the Lord. And the Lord counted or credited it to him for righteousness. Abram's righteousness was not in his works. It was in his faith. And that's where our righteousness will be as well. People say, what's the most important thing we could ever do uh, as a response to Jesus Christ? The most important thing we could ever do is faith. Because if you don't have faith, everything else doesn't matter. They enter into an agreement. The rest of chapter 15, God predicts the Egyptian bondage. And so we move to chapter 16. And in chapter 16, we notice that Abram and Sarai still have no son. And it seemed like they may have forgotten the lessons of chapter 15 where God simply says, don't be afraid, I'm your great reward, you know, I'm your shield, I'm your great reward. It, it, Sarah, Sarai and Abram come up with a plan and Sarai has a female servant named Hagar and Sarai says, Abram, take her and sleep with her and have the child by Hagar. They, they accept that Abram must have a son, but them and Sarai have no child and so now they think, it's still ungetaroundable, and they still think they have to figure out how. This is not Hagar's mistake, but her mistake in chapter 16 is when she becomes pregnant, she looks with contempt at Sarai. And Sar Abram gives way to Sarai, and Sarai deals harshly with Hagar. And so... We're going to read in chapter 16, verses 7 through 14. It says, The angel of the Lord found her being Hagar by a spring of water in the wilderness, the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? 
She said, I am fleeing from my mistress, Sarah. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, behold, you are pregnant and shall bear a son and you shall call his name Ishmael. And Ishmael is the great father of the Arabs. Because the Lord has listened to your affliction, he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone, and everyone's hand against him. And he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. So she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are a God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Bir Lahai Hua. It lies between Kadesh and Barad. Hagar is vulnerable and alone. And I ask you, is she a victim? And the answer is yes, she is a victim. She's vulnerable and alone, and the angel of the Lord is concerned for her and her child. He advises her to return and submit to Sarah. I don't look at her with contempt, submit to her. But the angel of the Lord interestingly predicts and names Ishmael. He's going to, the Lord promises a blessing for Ishmael, even if Ishmael is not going to receive the blessing that God had originally intended for Abraham, he's still going to be blessed. In the Middle East today, we look at Jews as opponents of Arabs and Palestinians, but a biblical perspective is they are both loved and blessed by God. So Hagar looks at the Lord and says, you are a God of seeing. You don't just see what's happening, but you're concerned with what's happening. You are a God of seeing. For truly here, I have seen him who looks after me, she says. As far as Abram is concerned, he's now 86 years old. He, he has come up with plans to help God out, and they haven't worked out exactly right. So the last reading is chapter 17, and it's a fundamental chapter in Abraham's story. Remember, he's 86 years old, and now in chapter 17, listen to, as we read the first eight verses, when Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, I am El Shaddai. Walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I'll give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. This great promise of covenant, not just between God and Abram, but God and Abram's offspring. And when we pick it up at the beginning of chapter 17, it just isn't working. There's been no evidence yet of God's promise even coming true. And when Abram has come up with different plans, it's not been what God's agreed with. And God comes to Abram at 99 years old, when all hope may be gone. How does a 99-year-old father a child? And God says, I am God Almighty. I am the God who doesn't have to follow nature's rules. I am God Almighty. And he calls Abraham to walk before him and be blameless. Not sinless, but blameless. And now God changes Abram's name to Abraham, a father of many nations. You know how through Abraham, 
all nations would be blessed. And now this promise, you're Abraham, a father of many nations. And God's promised relationship between himself and Abraham's descendants to be their God forever. And he promises a son by Sarah in chapter 17. And Abraham laughs at this. And, you know, how could this be? And even Sarah will laugh at this. But God says, why are you laughing? Don't laugh. I'm promising you. And so you'll call his name Isaac. Isaac will come. And to seal this promise, this relationship, the covenant of circumcision is established. But in all walks of faith, in any relationship with God, there's always this important question to settle. There's ourselves and God as actors in the story. But who will see things through? And we truly walk by faith when we realize the God who promises is the God who makes the promise come true. And we always get into trouble when we try to walk by sight and take matters into our own hands. God bless everyone.